Greetings this morning. It's good to uh, have another time to be together, even though we're online. I'm glad that we are able to meet like this. I hope that you are uh, doing well and ready to worship on the Lord's Day. Uh, It's a a great day to be worshiping wherever we may be. I have just a few announcements to share with you, and then we will have the call to worship. Uh, As as we uh, have been doing, we continue to uh, meet on, uh, we'll, we'll meet online for our six o'clock Sunday night uh, study in church history. So if, I hope that you'll join us online on YouTube and uh, catch that as we continue to look at uh, this Sunday night. We'll be in creeds and in confessions, and we'll be looking at uh, some of the earlier church councils as we uh, continue in that that uh, that time in history as the first few centuries. Also, Wednesday night, seven thirty, we'll be uh, gathering for prayer. And I uh, hope that you'll be able to join us on YouTube for that as well. This week was one of the weeks that we were going to have our uh, missions emphasis. And we had scheduled the, uh, the Einfelds from South Africa to be with us. And uh, of course, they are not, uh, it wouldn't make sense for them to try to come and, and do all of that. So what we have for you is uh, a, a few videos that will be sent to you through Remind. And if you don't know who they are, there's an introduction video that you can watch and get to know who they are. They've been over in South Africa for, uh, for a few decades and uh, several places throughout the continent they've been serving for, for many, many years. And so uh, if you already know them, and I know that they've been here, I think uh, that they were here just before I moved here. So it's been quite a while, but uh, many of you would be familiar with the Einfelds. And so there's just a, a kind of a reintroduction so that you can see uh, how they've been doing, and then of course uh, there will be a, a, a pretty lengthy update uh, of what they've been doing in South Africa and the various ministries, interviews with people. And so I hope that you'll take some time this week to uh, pay, to, to watch those and to see what God is doing uh, in South Africa with the ministry that the Einfelds uh, have been uh, laboring in. So those will be going out this week, and so this will be kind of a uh, a, a very small uh, uh, version of what we would do for missions emphasis um, since they can't be here. And we hope that uh, in the future we'll be able to actually have them in person. But those will be coming out this week, so let me encourage you to take some time and, and go through those and, and watch, through those, uh, watch for those updates. Happy birthday to uh, Kim Cole and to Rob Tanner this week. Hope that you have a wonderful day and that you get spoiled by your family as well. Happy anniversary to Jeff and Robin Tornstrom. I hope that you can take some time together and get away and get alone, uh, and uh, may God bless you with many more years to come. As usual, if you have a prayer request, let me know, and we can uh, share that through the church, uh, through the Remind, if uh, we would need to add it to our prayer list, or if we just wanted to let the church know uh, to be praying, uh, let us know if there's a need that we can be a help We want to be a help to you and to those around us. And once again, thank you for those of you giving faithfully in the tithes and offerings. You can continue to mail those in or drop those off uh, at the church throughout the week, and those will get to where they need to be. At this time, we'll have the call to worship. Well, good morning. It is a a special privilege to be able to uh, join you in your homes in worship. I had the opportunity this week to uh, hear a pastor in a a discussion group. And uh, one of the questions they asked was, uh, people say, I miss going to worship. And uh, maybe a more important question is, does God miss our worship? Does he miss our worship? I don't think that, uh, that uh, he is missing my worship uh, because I have been regularly enjoying him, even maybe in a greater way since we have had the, uh, the closed down, shut down um, uh, situation with the COVID. This morning uh, is a special Sunday because It is the Sunday before Memorial Day, a time to uh, recall. And uh, it's good to be able to recall those who have given much that we can have the privilege to worship, even though we can't worship together right now. 
but we also have the privilege to be able to have the Word of God and be able to share it and uh, to sing it, to read it, um, to uh, rejoice in it. The psalmist has written in the 96th Psalm, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of people, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. In the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. We're going to be considering in our text this morning the parable of unfaithful tenants. May we not be unfaithful as the tenants of God's goodness and provision and especially the great salvation and gospel that we have. May we be found faithful in worship, faithful in sharing it, faithful in entering into the joy of the Lord. We have much to be thankful for. Pray with me, will you, as we begin the service. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for that which we have in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege we have to worship. I am reminded from the words of Jesus who said one day when the, uh, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders said to the, uh, the Lord, cause the children and the people that are shouting for joy because Jesus is coming, that Jesus said, let them worship, let them rejoice. For if they don't rejoice, even the rocks will cry out. Lord, today, we are surrounded in, in uh, the springtime, the leaves and the trees and the flowers and the birds and, and the uh, fields beginning to be turned and uh, preparing for planting. There is rejoicing in this world, in this earth that you have given and created. May we as tenants here be found faithful, faithful to return to you, worship, praise, adoration. I thank you so much for all that you've allowed us to have. Even though we can't be together to worship, we are surrounded by reminders of who you are, your faithfulness, your glory. We worship you. We stand in, in awe and we praise your name. Bless us as we worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 to 7 Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes but it yielded wild grapes and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting, and he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you, as the vine dresser, prepared and chose your vines, and yet you were faithful to, to give us all that we have to make it where we can grow. And as Jerusalem failed away from you, and they became those wild grapes, sometimes we've done that as well. In our own flesh, we do that. Lord, we confess to you that we are those wild grapes, and we deserve that abandonment as you have done in this passage. We thank you that you sent your Son to redeem us. We thank you that you didn't just leave us to, to rot away, to be overtaken by the world around us. But as we live each day, we pray that you would renew in us a spirit, a desire to be good fruit for you. Not for our own uh, earning of salvation, not for receiving of blessing, but to bring glory to you, to show a good work that you have done, to show what you can do in your own power. We thank you, Lord, for these things. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Psalm 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. If you have your Bibles, will you take them and turn to Matthew chapter 21? And this morning we continue our studies in Matthew as we look at the second of Jesus' parables in this, in this smaller section, we have been looking at uh, Jesus' interaction just the last Sunday. We started this mini-series uh, within the section of Jesus' interaction with priests and elders, and uh, he delivers to them three parables. We looked at the first parable last Sunday, and this Sunday we look at the second parable that begins in verse number 33. 
Now, if you remember, just to kind of catch us up to where we, where we need to be, Jesus has been challenged by the priests and the elders uh, uh, concerning his authority. And when he says, I will answer your question if you answer my question, they fail to answer his question. And so Jesus says, well, I'm not going to answer yours. And we looked at that a little bit uh, last week, why he uh, doesn't answer their question in the way that he wanted them to, and yet in his explanation leads them to answer their own question and his. So Jesus then takes the offensive. No longer is he being challenged, he is going to challenge them. And as one, uh, one pastor uh, described it, Jesus will hold up a mirror to these men to show them how God sees them. Though they may seem to be religious on the outside, their hearts are unbelieving, their hearts are disobedient, and their lives are unfruitful, and God is going to uh, be, dis- and God is not pleased with them, and they are going to stand in judgment for their hypocrisy and their disobedience and their rejection. The first, uh, so in the first parable, Jesus uh, holds this mirror up to show them uh, their disobedience and their unbelief and their empty words as he brings the parable of the two sons. In this parable that we have before us, it's a, it's a, a parable of, the, of a man who plants a vineyard and uh, leases it out to wicked tenants. And as I said, Jesus is going to show them a mirror of who they are. And the first parable showing them that they were Uh, that they were unbelieving and unfruitful in this parable, showing that they are continuing that that theme of unbelief, but in in this story, highlighting more their rebellion. Now, as I said last week, often the meaning, the parables that Jesus gives, he does not explain the meaning to them Uh, to the people that he's giving the parable to. Usually it comes later when he is alone with a smaller group, typically the disciples, and he explains to the, uh, the disciples what the parable meant. But in these parables, at least, Jesus does tell the, the intended hearers what the parable actually means. And in this one before us, Uh, we will see that he will give uh, several truths to these men, highlight the goodness of God and the wickedness of man, uh, the unstoppable kingdom of God, and finally, uh, what what is a blessing of conviction. Now, as we read through this, and we'll read in just a moment, uh, let's understand that as, as we see this parable, uh, we, can, we can read it and understand it as a summary, albeit short, of the redemptive history that is laid out throughout the scriptures. So let's read Matthew 21, verses 33 through 46, and hear God's word. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him. And threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray and ask his blessing as we study his word. Father in heaven, we come now and humble ourselves before you and and under your word. We ask that as it is presented to us that we would receive it with open ears and 
believing hearts. Lord, we ask that uh, you would remove distraction from us, that we would be able to focus solely on what you have spoken. And as we hear these things, may we recognize them as the words of the living God, not just the words of a man, not just the words of, of, a, of a story long ago, but of the, 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 the everlasting, eternal, all-powerful God who has made known his will to us, who has revealed himself and his will to his creation. And may we uh, be responsible hearers then and obey what we, have been, uh, what we have been told by your word. And we ask your blessing on our time together and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. We'll be able to consider this passage uh, in uh, three sections and uh, we'll look at them uh, in that way. First as the parable, and we'll just uh, walk through the parable and make sure we understand what, what Jesus is saying to them. And secondly, the pronouncement. And thirdly, and finally, the perception. So we look at the beginning of verse number uh, 33, and Jesus delivers the parable to these men. He hasn't taken a break from his last one. He's just finished telling the parable of the two sons, and before they can respond or, or change the subject, he delivers this second one. And this parable uh, is to demonstrate and to highlight the goodness of God contrasted with the wickedness of man. Now, in this parable, it's very obvious to draw the symbolism uh, that, to Jesus is, that Jesus is, is uh, showing here. The master of the vineyard is God himself, the vineyard being the nation of Israel. The messengers that are sent are the prophets, and the son, of course, is Jesus Christ. And as the uh, priests and the elders will see at the end of the story, they represent the wicked tenants. Now, as we look at the story, we see that, that God, the master of the house, decides to plant a vineyard, and he, and he does all of this work to prepare this vineyard to produce fruit. Notice there in verse number 33 that he plants it, he puts the, the fence around it to protect it, he digs the wine press in it that, that as the grapes are harvested they might be uh, processed, and then he builds a tower around it to protect it from, from wild animals, from thieves, uh, anyone who might come and, and bring it harm. And then he chooses to lease it out to other people. Now, in this day and at this time in history, this was a very, very common thing and something that, that really anybody that heard the story would have been very familiar uh, with. The priests, uh, I'm sorry, the, the people of Israel, uh, were, uh, were, uh, vineyards were a very popular, uh, popular uh, thing at their, in, in this time. And it was very common for someone who is wealthy and foreign to come to a place to uh, get a vineyard started and then leave it in the hands of other people as, 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 a, as, a, as a landowner would leave uh, his, his uh, property and his, in his vineyard to these people, to these, to these uh, tenants. But we want to understand here that the, that the one in charge is the master, not the tenants. The, 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 the God, the one symbolized here, is the owner of it. The vineyard belongs to him, and he's the one who did all of the work. Well, the, the time for fruit draws near, and the, uh, the, the, the man that owns the vineyard, God uh, represented here, sends his servants to collect his fruit, that which is rightfully his. Of course, he wouldn't, uh, the, in the story, the, it wasn't uh, understood that, the, that the, the landowner would take absolutely everything because the, he had allowed the, uh, the, the tenants there to live and to benefit from their participation in this and to, to benefit from their, their labors as well. But there was a significant portion of this, of this uh, harvest that belonged to the landowner, and he was there, uh, he sent his emissaries to collect. Well, the, the tenants there had, had, for one reason or another, decided that they would reject the authority of this landowner and keep everything for themselves. So when the servants are, are sent, it says there in verse number 35, they took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Then, uh, then he sends the uh, second round, and, and he goes again and sends more servants than the first time, and they do the exact same thing. But notice here that, that these are the, the goodness of God is responded to with, with wickedness of man. 
It, is, it was God's prerogative to, to plant the vineyard. It was his prerogative to, to do all of the things that he did and then to lease it to these people. They had no claim of ownership. They had no, uh, no right to, to take anything more than what the master had allowed them, had agreed with them to. And yet they went beyond that and God's goodness was responded to with man's wickedness. They wouldn't give the fruit to the master. They rejected and abused and murdered his messengers. And in, in that, they reject the authority of God, not only through the messengers, but as we see, through the Son as well. Now, these messengers, as I said, are the prophets that God had sent to his people to warn them of their sin and of their responsibility towards God. And throughout the history of Israel, the prophets were ignored, they were refused, they were rejected, and many, often, many times they were killed. And so as Jesus is explaining the story to the, to the priests, he asks them then in verse number uh, 40, when the owner comes, after all of this time has been granted uh, and, and, and many, many opportunities to, to uh, submit to the authority of the landowner, he asks the priest, he says, well, what's going to happen to those tenants when the, when the master comes himself? And they say, that master is going to put those wretches to a miserable death and then let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. And, and, and these, these men then rightfully deserve judgment, and it's the priests themselves that recognize that the judgment that is coming on these wicked tenants is right and it is just and it is deserved. That wicked men will be condemned and destroyed, and they will be replaced by fruitful and obedient and respectful people, or a nation, as we'll see in a little later. But notice, again, that the patience of God is highlighted in such a wonderful way that in the fact that he sent multiple messengers, because at the very first time, and every single rejection, every single time that they rejected the, the master's authority, they deserved judgment. There would have been nothing wrong or unjust if the, if the story had only been, uh, if it had been shortened to that after the first rejection and after the first denial uh, of the first messenger and as the first messenger was killed, if the owner came and destroyed them and leased it to different people. But yet the, that's not how the story goes. The story continues with yet another messenger and yet another messenger and if we read it in Mark's account, in Mark 11, it's exaggerated even, even longer. And it's not groups of messengers going, but one at a time coming and reminding the people that they are responsible to another and that their, uh, that their fruit is, is due. And, and, and they respond in, in, in anger and in hostility and, and with death. And this is the, the marvelous patience and mercy that God shows in that though they deserve judgment, for God's mercy is extended in allowing them a chance to repent. God himself describes himself in Exodus 34 as a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. The Apostle Paul picks up on this theme in Romans chapter 2, describing the, the kindness of God, and yet these people have presumed upon the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that His kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. This is the mercy of God, and it is highlighted throughout the history of Israel. It is highlighted in the story of the parable of the landowners, and it is highlighted in our own lives that God is merciful. Yes, God is just, and God will judge, but God offers mercy and gives space to repent. But Paul continues, and he says, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. That judgment is going to come. There is an end and there is a reckoning. And God in His mercy has extended that and given the wicked sinners, those who have rejected Him, opportunity to repent. But they will not. So then we see the pronouncement then regarding the kingdom of God. Jesus then, as He finishes the story and as He gets the desired answer from them in verse 42, says, Have you never read the Scriptures? Haven't you read in the scriptures uh, is a phrase that Jesus often uses to eventually lead to that, that the scriptures are then pointing to himself. 
Every time Jesus uses this phrase, he is going to eventually show how those scriptures that he's pointing them to actually point to him. And he asks the priests then, who have read the scriptures? But what a, a rhetorical question, and yet, uh, yet his point is very clear. You've read them, but you really don't understand them. And he points them to the psalm, Psalm 118, in which says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The rejected son of the parable is now the rejected stone of the 118th Psalm. And what men have rejected is saying God has exalted. And the, the, the idea here is of the building of some, of some project and as the, the, the builder is going through and picking the most, uh, the, the most valuable of the stones and the most likely, uh, uh, most, uh, the best looking and in all of those, there's one that is rejected and overlooked. And, 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 and multiple builders have gone over and said, no, that's, that's of no good, no, no use to us. And yet that's the very stone that God himself has come. And he has said, not only is this chosen to be a part of the building, but it is the cornerstone, it is the headstone. And what men had then rejected, God has highly exalted. That being Christ himself, that God has exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And, and in this pronouncement, then, we see that the, we're reminded, the priests are at least, that the kingdom belongs to God, not to these men. See, in the story, the men began to act as if the vineyard belonged to them. They wouldn't relinquish any, any of the fruit to the master because by doing so, they would be recognizing his authority. And so every time he sent an emissary to them, they killed him to say, this is our land, this is our vineyard now, and we're going to do it uh, with it as we please. But Jesus reminds them, and the way that the story ends, and in the pronouncement of, of judgment, really, that the king kingdom has always belonged to God and it will always belong to God, that God will accomplish his purpose and that no one will stand in his way and no one will stop him. He will take the kingdom, he will take the vineyard and he will give it to whomever he chooses and he will get his fruit. In fact, he says that he has taken it from them and given it to a people producing its fruit. These are a people no longer, uh, these are, as John 1 says, this is a people that is born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Uh, this is a people that John says is those who receive him, who believe on his name. And these are the right, uh, these he's given the right to become the children of God. Jesus is telling these priests then that, that the kingdom has been taken away from you who believe that the kingdom belongs to you simply because of your, of your, of your ancestry, because you belong to Abraham through birth. And, and, and John says, and Jesus is saying here in Matthew, that the kingdom has now been taken from you and given to a new people. And it's not based on birth uh, biologically, but on a spiritual birth. Now, the Apostle Peter also picks up on this, and I'd like to read to you a passage from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 4. Peter writes, and he actually refers back to the same uh, psalm that Jesus is, is writing to. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, he picks up in verse number 4 saying, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, and this is where he quotes the psalm, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And another quotation from Isaiah, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And listen to what he says, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. 
Peter is saying that, that, that there are people who will stumble over this stone and then there will be people who will be blessed and honored because of this stone in that they believe on this stone, this cornerstone and this stumbling stone for many. And these are the people who have become the part of the chosen race, the royal priesthood, the holy nation and the people for God's own possession. But as Jesus says back in Matthew, that this stone will be an offense to many. And he says there that those who oppose him will fail and will be crushed. He says there uh, that the one who falls on this stone, verse 44, will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. There's an old rabbinic saying that uh, explains this uh, in in a kind of a humorous way. It says that if the pot falls on the rock, woe to the pot. And if the uh, rock falls on the pot, woe to the pot. Either way, woe to the pot, because the pot cannot stand against the rock. And regardless of which falls on which, the pot is going to be broken. And and as we come to the cornerstone, that stone of offense, that that stone of stumbling, uh, those on whom he falls or those on Uh, who fall on him will be broken. We cannot stand uh, against the cornerstone of God. Well, that brings us to the third part, the perception that the the, the priests have. They've understood the parable. They've answered Jesus in the way he wants. And now he has made his pronouncement of judgment on them. And and we see that the the priests uh, perceive that he was speaking about them. He's not just telling a story. He's not just uh, passing the time. He's not just delivering some vague truth. In fact, he is pointing his finger at them and saying, this is about you. And they finally see that and they understand that. In fact, he, it's, it's, it's almost an, an, an understanding that Jesus knows what they've been up to and what they're trying to do and, and how they're trying to discredit him and how they're trying to silence him and how they're plotting to kill him and, and take him out of the scene. And so in verse number 45 there, they, when, they, when they heard his parables, they perceived he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Sadly, their hearts were hardened because of, by this. Rather than being warned by mercy and grace of, of, of what is happening to those who oppose this, this rock, who oppose this rejected son, they still do not turn. They stumble over this stone, as Peter says, they were destined to do. And instead of turning to Christ, instead of repenting, instead of offering the fruit deserved to the Son, they plot to kill Him. And even after hearing how it was going to end for them, they go on in their unbelief and unrepentance. Now, the point of the story would be obvious to these guys and and really anybody that was familiar with the scriptures. God was replacing them with an obedient and fruitful people. So the priests would have understood what Jesus was saying here and really anybody that knew the scriptures, that God was replacing them with an obedient, fruitful people. That's exactly what he said, but they understood uh, to what extent he was talking about. Uh, Jesus is actually referring to another uh, parable that was told hundreds of years before by the prophet Isaiah. Now, we had this, uh, this passage read to us earlier, but if you would take, a, take your Bible and, and turn to Isaiah, and we'll just look at it for a moment. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 1. Now, we won't uh, spend here too, too much time, but I encourage you to take some more time in, on your own and look through it. And Isaiah 5 Uh, It says, let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard uh, on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And so he was saying there that that the the very same thing that happened in Matthew 21, that the, the, the master, God himself, decided to plant the vineyard and he did all of the work that was necessary to do. In Isaiah, though, it did not yield the type of fruit that he desired. It yielded wild and unedible fruit. And notice what he says there. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard in verse 5. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I'll break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I'll make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. 
I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. And for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. It's very, very similar to what, what uh, Jesus was saying there. And this Jesus is pointing them back to this at an earlier time when Israel is called out for their unrepentance, for their lack of fruit, for their rejection of God in their, in their hearts and in their lives. And the priests would be very familiar with this. And really anybody that was listening would have been familiar with this. In, in, in Isaiah, all of Israel was being highlighted uh, for their rejection. But here specifically, Jesus is pointing to the priests and saying that those who should have, should have known best, those who have been, had been studying and teaching others about him, in fact, would reject him. They did not repent. They would not believe. In fact, scripture, uh, they would fulfill the scripture and kill the very Son of God. As one writer put it, they were about to bring to a head the repeated rejection of God's prophets in the past. And they could now expect only a wretched end while others took their place. These men, though religious on the outside, were guilty of rejecting God's authority by their rejection of God's Son. And Jesus warned them what would happen if they, like the men in the story, rejected the Son and killed Him. Even so, the priests stumbled over the stone. They continued in their rebellion and did, as Peter says, as they were destined to do. Though they knew the Scripture though they were steeped in their religious acts, they still rebelled against the authority of God, the God they claimed to worship. They rejected the claims of His Son as the Messiah and King and Lord. Instead of turning and repenting, instead of bowing and believing, they plotted, they schemed, they arrested Him, they put Him to death. In a sense, they were saying, the vineyard is ours. We will do with it as we want. We will have it for ourselves and for our purposes. You will not take it from us. But Jesus was there to say, the kingdom will be taken from you and given to a new people. People who recognize the authority of the master, who receives his messengers, people who hear his son people who produce his fruit. So this is the message from God. How do you respect, respond to his authority? Jesus' hearers and Matthew's readers needed to understand that God desires spiritual fruit from his vineyard, and he will get it. He owns the field. He controls the vineyard, and he will have his way. But how will we respond to him? Well, Scripture tells us that right away from the very beginning, we rejected God's authority. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, in Adam, we, we rebelled against God's command and did as we pleased. And from the very beginning, we have been born in sin and we continue in sin and really don't mind the consequences. But for centuries, God in His mercy sent His prophets to warn the people of sin and of disobedience and of their rebellion, but they rejected them. They killed them. They ignored their messages. They ignored the warnings and continued on in their sin. Finally, God sent His very own Son, Jesus Christ, to come to show mercy and grace and the kindness and justice of God. He too was rejected and ignored and despised and killed. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And the warning of judgment, the warning of destruction is no mere threat. These are not words uh, alone that Jesus is saying here. God will judge and destroy those who rebel and reject his authority. He will not be denied. He will accomplish his purpose. So then how will we respond? Will we respond as those of the parable, as those like the priests in, in continued hard-hearted rebellion, or in humble submission, in repentance for 
the earlier, the previous rejection, but now by faith, a submission and a receiving of the Son. See, the message of this parable extends all the way down to us. As the church, we are part of that new chosen people. We have been given the kingdom, and we must be about the business of producing the fruits of the kingdom and offering them to the Lord. Like the wicked farmers, though, we have rebelled and rejected the authority. We've, we've ignored the warnings of his messengers, the prophets in his word, maybe the very people that have, have come to you and, 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 and asked you questions that would turn you to the Lord. We have the warning of his son, the word that was made flesh. How do we respond to those words? We must heed the warnings and turn to him by faith. Now, the nation of Israel as a whole, and here in particular, its leaders rejected the prophets. They rejected the Messiah. And as a result, they lost the kingdom. Let us not make the same mistake. In the, in the book of Romans, Paul describes this as branches that have been broken off so that wild branches could be grafted in through faith. And he says there, do not be arrogant toward the branches if you are. Remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. He, say, he goes on to say, they were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will He spare you. It's a very simple question, a very simple uh, message to hear, but not necessarily one that's easy to respond to or one that's easy to, to listen to. The priests and the elders in this, para, in this passage here understood what Jesus was saying. They understood it so much that they wanted to kill Him for it. Not because they didn't understand, but because they didn't believe it but because they rejected it. What about us? When we hear the words of God, whether it be a rebuke, whether it be an instruction, whether it be a command, how do we respond? If we're not obedient, if we're not submitting, we are rejecting the authority of the Master. If we're not producing the fruit that He is required, and we're not obeying the Master. If we simply ignore the truths that we hear and the commands that are written down for us and that are taught to us through faithful teachers and preachers, then we are not submitting to His authority. So when we hear the words of God in personal reading, in the preaching of it, in the teaching of it, let us hear it and receive it. Jesus said oftentimes, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And let us not harden our hearts, but rather bow to the authority of God's word and God's son. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word and in the son. Lord, we are a people who do not deserve to know you, or to be blessed by you in the ways that we have, and yet uh, you have so graciously uh, blessed us in Christ. We confess that we have, uh, at times past and, and even times present, rejected your authority. We do as we want. We, we yield to our, our sinful flesh. We, we yield to our own desires, our own nature, and do not do as you require but we give thanks for the mercy that you've shown in Christ. We're thankful for the salvation that you show to us and that you give to us in him. And Father, we pray that as people of the new nation, as people to whom the kingdom has been given and we have been uh, graciously been made a part of, we pray that we might be fruitful and obedient, that we might be responsive to the words that we hear. As we read the Bible on our own this week, as we hear it preached to us week after week and even sometimes throughout the week, uh, may we be responsive hearers 
May we be uh, obedient uh, servants who produce the fruit that you require. May we rely on the Spirit who produces that fruit in us as we've We've learned that the the, the Spirit produces that fruit within us as we abide in Christ. And of course then, there are those that we know, maybe those listening now who have yet to bow that knee to Christ. Still in their their rebellion, still still in their rejection, and yet you still in mercy, holding out your, your, your arms and giving them space to repent. We pray then that they would turn and believe the gospel, that they would bow the knee to Christ, and that they would be welcomed into that new family, that new people who are producing the fruits that you require. God, help us, please, this week. Help us to live in ways that would honor and glorify you. Help us to be uh, servants who please you in everything that we do and say. May we shine the light of the gospel on those around us. May we call others to repent and believe of their sin as we continue to follow you ourselves. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things and for his sake. Amen. And now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and the God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts Establish them in every good work and word. And God bless you.